In today's video, we're going to discuss four reasons why installing CO2 sensors for the purpose of demand control ventilation does not work in older buildings. It works in new buildings, it does not work in older buildings. So if you are putting in a fee proposal or you are promoting an energy efficiency initiative that requires the installation of CO2 sensors for the purpose of measuring and detecting as the building's occupancy, people are reducing, and then you're gonna reduce the amount of outside air to save energy, that doesn't work in existing buildings or older buildings. In today's video, we're gonna discuss in sort of detail the first of the four problems. In another video, perhaps next week, uh, we'll do the remaining three. So the first point is that older buildings have a much lower design outside air rate than premium new buildings. So with you know, A grade and premium grade buildings, you know, very big, beautiful buildings in prime locations where the building owner or the developer is trying to attract high profile tenants that will pay the highest rents for these floors, the highest, you know, dollars per meter square rent. Those type of buildings have a, a very high outside air design rate. So they are not designed to bring in the code minimum outside air. They are designed to bring in perhaps 50% more outside air or 100%, you know, double the code minimum outside air because these buildings, those type of high profile tenants, they value the wellness or well-being of their staff. So they want to have much higher outside air rates. In the past, you know, we didn't really care that much about you know, considering the occupant's wellness. We sort of cared more about energy efficiency um, and not bringing in too much outside air because we, we had to buy bigger chillers and bigger boilers. So nowadays, there's a bit more of a drive on considering the wellness of occupants. So premium grade, A grade buildings, commercial offices in the city, beautiful, expensive buildings, those buildings generally have very high outside air rates. So if you're sitting in a brand new building or you're a commissioning tech and you're working on a, on a new premium project and you go through all the air handling units in the low rise and all the air units in the high rise and you flip through the graphics on a warm day, so it's 30 degrees Celsius outside, we're not in economy mode, all those AHUs, the outside air dampers, they're going to be quite open still. Although you're not in economy, those outside air dampers could be around 50% open because there's a very high outside air rate designed for this building. Now, if you walk out the ground floor lobby across the road to that building over there that was built in the 1970s, 1980s, or 1990s, when you know designers were only concerned with bringing in the code minimum outside air, that's what we had to sort of abide by and therefore we could have you know the right size chillers and the right size boilers on those buildings if you walk across there and look at the graphics for the six low rise air handlets and the six high rise ahus and you flip through those graphics you will see on the same day 30 degrees outside not in economy cycle those outside dampers they are much more closed they are say you know 15 percent open probably 10% open because those AHUs are not designed to draw in 100% more outside air than the code requirement. Those AHUs are designed to only bring in the code minimum amount of outside air. So the dampers are not very open. So this is what happens. Your fee proposal says um, that you're gonna install uh, two CO2 sensors on every floor in the common return ducts. So on the floor, this half of the floor, there's a common return CO2 sensor. This half of the floor is a common return CO2 sensor. 
and there's 30 floors. So you've got 60 CO2 sensors that you're gonna install as part of this energy efficiency initiative. And for the purpose of this discussion, let's say that it's $1,000 per sensor. That sounds like a lot, but that $1,000 is for a new sensor, installing a cable in the ceiling back to the riser, probably out of hours, buying a controller expansion module, installing it in there, updating the BMS function description or the control sequences or the description of operations, whatever country you're in, updating the point schedules, writing all the code, downloading the controllers on all the floors, downloading the controllers on all the air handling units, and then going to commissioning phase, testing all the inputs, testing the control strategies. That's a very big project to do that. And this is where it starts to fall apart, which some of you might have really worked out. In your software program, you've got that as the CO2, the max CO2 is reducing, you're gonna reduce the outside air from this max limit, damper position, to this minimum limit, damper position. And you download the program. And then you walk into the plant room to do your final testing and you realize, oh my gosh, these air handling units, the design outside air has the damper at only 10% open. Not like across the road, the job you worked at last year or two years ago where the, the max position was 50% open or 60% open. In this building that was designed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, where we don't have an oversupply of outside air, the outside air damper is only 10% open, 15% open. How much range do you have to reduce that outside air damper? It's, the max is 10%, so what are you gonna go down? 5%, 5%. So you've just spent all this money um, and all you can do for the six AHUs in the low rise and the six AHUs in the high rise is to reduce their outside air dampers by 5%, 6%. That's not, that's not worth it. And it gets more complicated than this because the amount of outside that comes into an air handling unit, it's not just determined by occupancy levels. It is also there to do two things. One is to maintain building positive pressurization. So you've got these massive toward exhaust fan running and they're exhausting air out of the building. We have to put more outside air in to still maintain the building's positive pressurization. So that's also gonna impact on how far you can close that damper off. Cause you start closing it off and the building goes into negative pressurization, starts sucking, you know, hot air and, and rubbish through all the cracks of the building. So you gotta watch out for that. The second thing is that uh, here in Australia, I think, I'm not a mechanical engineer, that the minimum ventilation rate, just for a building's ventilation, we're not talking about CO2 or people, just the ventilation rate of the building is 0 0.35 liters per second per meter squared. Not per person, per meter squared, the area of the building. We have to meet that code requirement also for you know minimum ventilation. So there's there's a few things that are going to restrict how far you can pull this damper down. So I'm sure you'll get that right. It's not worth it. In older buildings where we don't have a massive oversupply of outside air, it doesn't financially stack up. The return on investment for the owner is very poor. It's also very embarrassing because you've just charged your client to do this, you've done the work, you've tested it, and if anybody actually bothers to do a proper measurement and verification process to actually determine you know, how much saving was made from this particular control strategy, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be very low to nothing. So the takeaway here is demand control ventilation in older buildings, that opportunity, it needs to you need to drop it down the list of things that you offer to people. Because for $60,000, and it's actually gonna get a lot more expensive than that next video, for that money, there's much easier ways to save energy. Now in my mind, to wrap this up, in my mind, this one point, for me is a deal breaker, complete deal breaker. 
Next video, the three other things. They're not just some miscellaneous secondary things that that throw them into discussion. They are deal breakers as well. So if you're not quite convinced yet, keep an eye out the next video because there's going to be three more reasons that make this really, really not worth it. So the first... Wow, didn't even get one sentence out.